I've been preaching off the back page the last few weeks. And uh, I started with worship, and I should have spent probably six weeks on worship. And last week we considered evangelism, and I should probably spend six weeks on evangelism. Uh, but we're just going week by week. I, I think this week, though, I will not be able to consider fully uh, discipleship. Uh, discipleship, according to definition on the back page, is to teach those who profess faith in Jesus Christ the doctrines of the Bible, promoting growth in the spiritual life, to learn how to live for the glory of God. God... Uh, directed us as Christians to make disciples. Uh, sometimes we've shortchanged people by making converts. Uh, we have worked really hard to change people's minds uh, by argument and by reason. And their minds for a while have been changed, but their hearts have not. And soon they fall back into the old ways. Uh, many churches, uh, probably most, have membership which far exceeds uh, their attendance. Uh, some churches have a membership three times as large as those who regularly come to church in that particular place. Uh, and that's a sad thing uh, to know that people have... Uh, made professions and have joined the church, uh, might even have been baptized or gone through some other uh, ritualistic routine, and, uh, and then have fallen away, fallen back to the world uh, from which they have come. Uh, discipleship is designed to bring us uh, beyond just conversion and to put us to the task of teaching and training people how to live the way God wants us to live in this world. And I'll have to say we probably haven't done a really great job of that uh, through the years. But I want us today, and, and if you looked at the title of the, the message, and I don't generally title messages, but this one just kind of begged to be titled, uh, it's discipleship in terms of the discipline of spiritual warfare. Uh, when Jesus was alive on the earth and gathered around himself disciples, it was for the purpose of training them in the things they needed to know and do in order to live in such a way as to be witnesses good witnesses, effective witnesses of His life and His death and His redemptive work for mankind. Uh, he charged them to go and make disciples of others. And so He has charged us. Uh, in Jesus' day, a disciple was one who came and sat at the feet of the Master in order to be taught uh, they came fully committed to that purpose. And they would then become followers. And they would go on and follow Him. And then uh, as time progressed and that particular master uh, or rabbi, they would call Him, uh, would pass from the scene. Then one of the disciples who was uh, best trained would become the master and gather to Him uh, disciples. Uh, but there was more to discipleship than just learning doctrine. Now, there was a discipline involved. You couldn't just be haphazard in your discipleship. Now, there was discipline that was necessary. It's sort of the same way that people are engaged in military service today. If you go to the recruiting station, and, and we were somewhere the other day and, and saw the armed forces recruiting station and they had uh, doors for every branch of the service. And I thought it was interesting you didn't just go in the main door uh, but they had a door for the army, the navy, the air force, the marines 
and what was the other one? Maybe the Coast Guard or something. But but they had a separate door for each one. But if you went in one of those doors and you sat down across from the recruiter and said, uh, I'm considering being a, a, a Marine, but I'm not really sure if that's what I really want to do. Uh, they might sign you up on that basis, but you would find out early on that you had to really make more of a commitment to that. Because you couldn't go to boot camp and say, you know, I really don't feel like PT today. I really think I'd rather go home and see mom because I haven't seen her for, you know, 48 hours. And that wouldn't fly. And neither would it fly if you were going to be a disciple of someone. There was discipline involved. Discipleship would be really neat if we didn't have to worry about discipline. But we do. And one of the reasons why we do is because the pathway of the Christian is not a bed of roses. It's not sweet and flat and soft and wide and well-known and well-traveled. The path of the Christian life is difficult. I would like for you to, in your bulletin, you have Luke 6, 20 to 31 there. That is the context in which we're speaking today. Luke chapter 6. I need to tell you that uh, this is Luke's rendition of the Beatitudes that you find in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, these Beatitudes in Luke's Gospel are not as well known as those in Matthew, although it's the same incident uh, that Luke reports, but he reports retrospectively by talking to others. He was not an eyewitness to this. And it seems to me, if, if you just read through it, you will find that, that Luke's uh, account of the Beatitudes is a little more difficult for us to take than Matthew's. But let's begin reading in verse 20 and set the stage uh, for what I'd like for us to consider today. Luke 6.20 And Jesus lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye, shall, ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. And we'll stop right there. That's going way beyond what I, uh, what I really want to talk about this morning, but I wanted you to see the whole picture of this. Uh, he uh, begins by... Uh, telling about those who are blessed. And we know those, who, uh, those poor who are blessed because theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Uh, we know that there is a blessing upon those that uh, hunger 
for they shall be filled. Uh, blessed are they that weep, for they shall laugh. Uh, that carries uh, great import to those of us uh, who would witness to how God meets the needs of His children and those who have been who have been blessed of Him. I would like for us to focus this morning on two verses here in Luke 6, verses 22 and 23. Because they apply to the very situation we find ourselves in today. Uh, but in uh, Sunday school and also a little bit earlier in the service today, made some references to things that have been going on recently in our country, uh, especially uh, what has happened this past week uh, with decisions that the Supreme Court, the highest authority that our country recognizes, uh, have uh, some decisions that they have made. And we want to address a couple of things today. Luke 6, 22 and 23 says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Uh, rejoice because we're in good company, is what he says. Notice also in verse 22 that the blessing is conditional. He says, blessed are you when these things happen to you for my name's sake, for the Son of Man's sake. It does us no good uh, to be obstinate and mean-spirited and opinionated and every other kind of thing uh, if it is not for Christ's sake. Everything we do as Christians is to be for His sake. It is supposed to be on His behalf that we live and move and have our being. And for us to uh, become irritated because people don't react to us the way we think they should uh, when we're mean and nasty to them, uh, that's on us. That's not for His sake. I just want to make some uh, make a statement here, and and I'll probably have to just read this because I don't want to I don't want to just off the cuff thing. I want to have a record of of what I've said because we're faced with some difficult times in our country today. Uh, we have faithfully been praying for our nation and for our nation's leaders. And uh, when they have made uh, decisions, we have gritted our teeth and gone on because God tells us to honor those in authority over us. And we recognize that, that at the end of the day and beyond all human reasoning, God is still in charge of everything and God is allowing things to move in the direction they're moving for a particular purpose. And still, we have difficulty connecting the dots of the things that are going on in our country today. And I would like to just begin by making this, this statement about the Supreme Court uh, action this past week. The Supreme Court decision to open the door for unlimited same-sex marriage along with the long-standing decision to allow abortion on demand, brings us closer to the prophetic announcement of our president not long after taking office that the United States of America is not a Christian nation. History has been rewritten to reflect the left-wing deception that this nation has never been Christian even in its founding. The reality is that the rest of the nations which constitute our global society recognize the Christian foundations of America and its ongoing Christian values to some degree 
and the oppressed of every other country want to immigrate to America like nowhere, nowhere else in the world. Because of the Christian values which have influenced our way of life, many of the nations of the world hate us. The Declaration of Independence declares this endowed truth that this country was endowed by its creator with certain values that are not found in other places in the world. If we can just look at that a moment, I sometimes have difficulty describing the country we live in today as a Christian nation. Now when I look from my ideal to the way things have gone, I see a, a, a drastic departure from Christian values. Or maybe we should say Judeo-Christian values. Uh, we see uh, the laws that have been cast in this country through the years as being based on Mosaic law, which is uh, acknowledged in the very uh, room in which the Supreme Court makes its decisions uh, carved into the marble of the walls uh, happen to be the Ten Commandments. Can you imagine? And yet we have departed in many ways from those very values. And it's difficult for us to recognize this to be true. But I also understand that people from around the world who have never breathed a breath of freedom, who recognize in this country something special to the, to the degree that they want to come here for freedom's sake. They recognize this as a as a Christian nation. And other countries in the world lean on us for support because of our Christian giving of our resources. And yet they hate us because their values are not the same as our values. Let me make my, my second statement. The majority opinion of the Supreme Court this week contained the best reasoning that humanism has to offer in guaranteeing the newly minted civil right of equality in marriage to those who wish to overthrow every tradition and belief of a society that has in time past placed its trust in God, his values, and his commands. Justice Kennedy, in writing the opinion, went out of his way to characterize those who hold to the traditional view of marriage between one man and one woman as being ignorant and bigoted. These words have lately been served up by left-leaning radicals to describe pro-life and pro-morality Christians as well as those who reject the world's view of evolutionary creationism and scientific authoritarianism. Uh, we have been, by the highest court in the land, colored as being ignorant and bigoted. I go back to verse 22 in Luke 6. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company, shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Because we believe what the Bible says, we're told that that makes no difference. That that's a religious argument and cannot be used in the public arena. So uh, we're left to try to reason with them out of the reasoning of the world, uh, which is biased against us. Um, we have basically been placed upon a pedestal for all men to hate us because of our bigotry and our intolerance. And we're seeing what Jesus said in Matthew 6, or excuse me, Luke 6, 22, we're seeing that come to pass in our day. Do not be surprised 
when they want to separate us from their company. As if we did not already seek to be separated unto God and His exclusive use. Uh, They will then begin to separate us from society. Do not be surprised. Third statement, we are now told that the majority of our media-influenced friends, neighbors, and family members are in favor of same-sex marriage, even though many polls have shown that the majority of Americans still believe that homosexual behavior is sin. Many uh, many media-driven polls also show that a large segment of the population believes that Christians are ignorant, intolerant, and hateful. And some professing Christians seem to be just those things. But not us. We cannot be. There is an old maxim that says what one generation tolerates, the next generation accepts, and the next generation embraces. This axiom is at work here in that societal leaders are telling us that we must accept same-sex marriage as equal and as normal as traditional marriage. We already hear about the teachers and social workers employed by the government encouraging children and young people to experiment with all signs of sexual activity, all kinds of sexual activity, since it is only normal anyway. They also encourage our youth to ignore the views and words of their parents and religious leaders. These views and words are considered outdated, hateful, intolerant, ignorant, and even harmful to our young people. I'm not reading these things to you to discourage you, but to encourage you to begin to think as right-thinking Christians ought to think. Uh, We're in a war, and it is a spiritual war. We'll consider that in a moment. But I have one other statement that I want to make. And it's couched in a question for you. What of us who are called by the name of Christ? What about us? Even our children's history books illustrate the problem we face as Christians. Now listen to the, to the progression. Progressing a little at a time, the Christian influence upon our founders was related to or relegated to sidebars. Uh, if you read a magazine or a book or something, they will have uh, some text and then there will be a, a section along the side, a sidebar in which a little more detail is given about a certain thing that is mentioned. In our textbooks that our children are using today, uh, 50 years ago, uh, the Christian influence was in the text of the textbook. Now it's relegated to the sidebar. It's no longer in the text. Important though it might be, the writers did not want to interrupt the flow of the text by distracting people with religious information, especially in light of supposed separation of church and state questions. Well, let's, not, let's mention it, but we don't want to bother with it too much. The succeeding step in this progression was relegating any mention of religion to the footnotes. No longer on that page, but in small print in the back of the book, you can find out something about the religious foundations of this country. Our religious heritage has become a footnote, and we Christians are in the process of having the same thing done to us as institutions and as individuals. We are fully engaged in spiritual warfare as we speak. What shall we do about it? How do we deal with the situation that God has placed us in today? Uh, We can go hide our heads in the sand. Um, We can dig a hole big enough for that. And we can pretend it's not happening. Now we can just go our own way 
and talk about things that don't have anything to do with what we're facing today. Let me tell you that a revolution is not going to solve the problem. A reformation is not going to solve the problem. I heard somebody the other day or read somebody the other day on the internet that was calling for a new, uh, a new awakening, uh, uh, another revival to come across the country as in some of the awakenings of the past. And I've got to tell you, revival is not going to do it. Well, a, a new reformation is not going to do it. What we need is people who receive a new heart coming in repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ who come under the power of the gospel as related in Romans 1.16. The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe. And we have relegated the gospel to a secondary status uh, even as our, uh, in, in, in our evangelical speaking. Even as we hold it high uh, as a priority, we uh, hardly speak of the gospel anymore. Let's look at verse 22 in Luke 6 again. Blessed are you when men hate you. That doesn't sound reasonable, does it? That goes against everything that we think ought to be right. But there's much said in the Bible concerning the hatred of the world. Jesus said, they hate me. Why do you think it unnatural that they would hate you? Look what they did to our Lord. They hung Him on a tree thinking they were doing the world a service, why should we think that we deserve anything less than that? Blessed are ye when men hate you. And then he says, Blessed are ye when they shall separate you from their company, when they don't want to be around you anymore. Uh, people from time to time, Beverly reminds me, now look at me and they don't think I'm a fun guy. They, uh, maybe they think I'm too serious. Uh, I, I don't really intend to intimidate anybody. Maybe it's size, I don't know. But, but there are a lot of people don't want Christians around. Some of them genuinely do not believe that there's a God. But I think by far the majority don't want Christians around because Christians remind them of their own guilt. Christians somehow prod their conscience concerning their own life situation. And they don't want to do anything about it. So they want to separate themselves from Christians. Blessed are you when they shall reproach you. Uh, when they revile you, when they curse you, uh, when they tell you exactly what they think of you, blessed are you. Blessed are you when they cast out your name as evil. The Bible tells us that the day has come. <laughs> it says it will come, but it has come when men say good is evil. And evil is good. And they will look at us just dripping a vile hate and say, you are hateful. They will look at us in such a posture of intolerance and say, you are intolerant. And then they will say, Jesus was intolerant. What does that mean? The Bible tells us that God is intolerant of sin. And so ought we to be in its every form, 
and especially intolerant of our own sin. First, uh, the Bible's clear that we need not judge another until we have judged ourselves. Then, when we have taken care of the log in our own eye, we can remove the log that plagues another. Or the splinter, excuse me, that plagues another. We are involved in spiritual warfare. We're not involved in warfare against the Supreme Court justices or the President or the Congress or the atheists or the unbelievers. But we are in a battle. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. It reads, Finally be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. This familiar passage for many is often read, hardly ever accomplished in our lives. Notice what he says. If we are to stand... We must stand in the truth. Verse 14. We must stand in the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Also in verse 14. In verse 15, we're to stand prepared in readiness to to share the gospel, to speak on behalf of the Lord. As someone asked, How do we know what to say? How do we respond? The Bible tells us that if we are if we are in tune with what God wants to do in us and His Spirit is working through us, He will tell us what to say. I've got to tell you, I have always been uh, at a loss sometimes. I could never be a debater. Because my mind doesn't work fast enough to come up with all these answers. My mind is plodding. It's going slowly and someone says, what about that? And, and you know when I think about it? Is later. I think, that's about that. That's what I should have said. You ever have that happen to you? Go back and find that guy and say, you know what? This is what I should have said. Let God speak to you. Let God work in you. If we never expose ourselves to the questions of the enemy, we will never realize what their true answers are. Be prepared. Be in readiness to speak the Word of God, to speak the Gospel of peace. In verse 16 it says, In all circumstances take up faith. I think some of us are more than willing to have faith in God for the future that is ours when we go to heaven someday. But we're reluctant to step out in faith in this world in which we live. God wants us to live by faith. The Bible says over and again, the justified shall live by faith. Faith, those who have been justified by the blood of Christ shall live by that same faith that brought you to Him.
Verse 17 says, Take the helmet of salvation. You have been saved, have you not? By just simply trusting in the shed blood of Christ at the cross as your only means of saving. By trusting in that, by coming in repentance and faith, that's our salvation. We stand in it. The Bible says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. You know that verse? People are going, I thought salvation wasn't of works. Salvation is not of works, but salvation produces works. Work out your salvation. With fear and trembling, the next verse says, For it is God who works in you to will and do according to His good pleasure. It is God who's at work. But unless we're willing to stand up and work it out, we'll not see God working in us. Verse 17 also tells us about taking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Don't get caught trying to use human reasoning to argue somebody into agreement. Use the Word of God. The Word of God is all we need. I get caught sometimes trying to figure it out myself when what I really need to do is go to the Word. And then verse 18 tells us that we're to pray. We're to pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, all kinds of prayer, all the time, whatever is needed. I remember watching this past week another uh, incredible event as Nick Walinda walked across a canyon. I don't know why he would do that. But he walked a quarter of a mile across a canyon, 1,500 feet down. The whole time he was walking across there, he was was saying, thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And on and on. And, and, And I don't know what his mindset is or what his faith is, but I know what he was doing all the way across that canyon is what we're supposed to be doing all the way across the canyons we traverse every day. Pray without ceasing. Seeking God in everything. That's how we are to live. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 6 says this. Second Corinthians 10. Three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when our obedience is complete. When we're walking with Him, we have power within us to overcome the strongholds that stand. Erected by the enemy to distract us, to discourage us, to destroy us. But we have come in obedience to Christ to allow Him to work through us for the tearing down, the destruction of of strongholds according to His divine power. Romans 8, 27. I'm not here to discourage you. I'm here to encourage you by what the Word of God says we have available to counter all the actions of the enemy in this world. 
Romans 8, 27, And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. I'll just pause here a second. And tell you not to get distracted by the idea of election and predestination. Because we get so caught up in that that we forget what it is that God designed us to be. And it is to be conformed to the image of His Son. Is that something I can do? Not by any means. Notice it's not to conform, it is to be conformed. In Romans 12, 2, it says that we are not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. And notice it does not say that we are to transform ourselves. We are to be transformed. It is the power of God working on us that we might be transformed by the renewing of our mind. It is the power of God who is working in us that we might be conformed to the image of His Son. Romans 8.30 And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? I ask that question again. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Well, the whole world can be against us. All the minions of the spiritual underworld can be against us. That great enemy of the saint, Satan himself, can be against us. But who can be against us that matters if God is for us? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Huh. Yeah, they're going to say hateful things about us. They're going to cast us out of their group, their society. We'll be like saints of old who wandered in the wilderness without a home. We'll be like those who have no place to go other than to the nurture of God Himself. We'll be those who have no reason to be de- become dependent upon our government or its agencies because our only dependence is on God Himself. I go back to what Luke said after these verses. When he said, uh, woe unto you who are rich because you have your consolation. There are people today who are trusting in their money, in their possessions, in their properties. What happens when all that's gone? Then we're right where God wants us. Woe unto you who are full because you will become hungry because you'll recognize that what you're full of does not satisfy and I'm not making a statement about what they might be full of. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And if He's doing that after having done what He has done and He is interceding for us, what do we have to fear? Someone already alluded to it this morning, I think. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What can they do to me? In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? We have died to all the things of the world. We're already dead. Who can kill us? All they can do is hasten our journey home. The 
Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Can you think of anything? Uh Uh-uh. Have you committed yourself to Him? Have you trusted in Him? Have you come in repentance and faith to the foot of the cross and seen there the sacrifice that He made for us in our place that we might have life eternal and forgiveness of sin? If so, there's nothing that will ever separate you from that. There are many today who believe that you can be saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost back and forth. I'll tell you what, if I could ever have gotten lost after I got saved, I would be lost. If my salvation based on what Jesus did was not once and for all and permanent, the devil could have got me any million number of ways. But he can't and I'm saved and no one, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Not tribulation, not distress, not persecution, not famine, nor nakedness, nor danger, or sword, as it's written for your sake. Or we are being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. I don't understand that passage. Why is it there? That doesn't seem to be encouraging, does it? What does it mean to be holy? Set aside for God's God's exclusive use. You know what the sheep were? The sheep in Jesus' day were set apart. They had one purpose. Especially the sheep that were pure. They were set apart for God. Now, are you one of those pure sheep? Now, you're thinking in terms of your behavior. Now, what about your heart? The Bible says that you stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, perfect and complete and holy. You've been set apart for Him. If He wants to use you on the sacrificial altar, is that okay with you? Or do you want to run back out onto the dirty road, wallowing in the mud, continuing to keep on living rather than fulfilling the purpose God has for you? That's why this verse is here, verse 36. We're killed for His sake, for His worship, for His purpose. We have no reason to think we're anything other than sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Luke 6, 23. And we'll close. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. What has been your purpose in life? To please God in everything you do or to please the world? To please yourself? to just go with the flow, to not make any waves, to just be until you no longer are? Or is your desire truly to be all that God designed you to be? To do what God designed you to do? When When Paul referenced, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, he cited that passage from Psalm 44, 22, 
And the meaning is that for the sake of God and his pure worship, saints of old were frequently put to death or exposed to persecutions which often issued in death. As New Testament saints, we face that same fate for the sake of Christ and His Gospel. Is there any other way to live? Jesus said, Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. Rejoice and leap for joy. God has placed us here for just a time like this. And He says, Your reward is great in heaven. We are to stand faithful and true and committed to what God has given us. i got a whole other page of notes, but you don't want them now. I want you to think about this. Think about what God has placed you here for. In the face of discouraging news out of Washington, we have a purpose for which God has placed us here. Let's go do it. The discipline to be a disciple comes in the face of spiritual warfare. It can be dangerous. It can be life-threatening. What will we do when the time comes? The time is here. Let's pray. Father, in these moments I ask that you would speak to our hearts and give us wisdom and truth that we might understand your word and how it applies to us and what we ought to be doing about it. May we not be of those who look at the rough road ahead and decide to give up. But may we be truly disciples of the Lord Jesus, set apart for Him, that we might worship Him even to the degree of giving up our lives willingly and with joy because you so desire it. Thank you for your word. Encourage us this day by your spirit working in us. In Jesus' name, amen.